that handout, you want to locate, um, I think it's page 8. Page 8, slide 24 is where we're going to start. And you might recall the last time, I think the last time I was with you, um, we began to get into part three of this book I wrote, The Coming Kingdom. So we're, we're on the home stretch, believe it or not. I know you guys don't believe that. Mile 20 is the hardest, right? 20 to 26. 20 to 26 is much harder than the previous 19 miles. So hang in there with me. But we're in part three where it's the so what question. So we've explained that the kingdom is in a state of postponement today, part one. Part two, we've refuted the uh, verses that people use to argue that we are in the kingdom. That took a lot of time, didn't it, going through all that? And now we're in part three, who cares? And maybe I should have taught, taught this part first. But sort of the premise that I'm working from here, and by the way, you might want to open your Bibles to Matthew 4 and verse 19. Kind of the premise that I'm operating from is when the church gets confused about the subject of the kingdom. And the church begins to see itself as, the, you know, kind of the way Roman Catholics look at their church the vicar of Christ on earth. Uh, You recognize that word vicar. Uh, Vicarious. We get the word vicarious from that. Vicarious means in the place of. So that's basically Roman Catholic amillennialism. They view themselves as the representatives of Christ on the earth. In other words, they are his kingdom on the earth. While even though the king is not here. And it's not just Roman Catholics that teach kingdom now theology. You find it in countless other movements. So when when the church looks at itself as the kingdom and begins to see itself as the kingdom, what basically you have is soil from which a plethora of false doctrines naturally arise. They naturally arise, they logically arise. And one of our problems is we don't connect the dots very well because we spend all of our time shooting at the false doctrines. Not understanding that if we went after the foundation, then these false doctrines wouldn't exist. So what I have here in the final third of the course is nine false doctrines that emerge in the church as a consequence of kingdom now theology. And I just had a chance to teach all all nine of these in five sessions at uh, Middletown Bible Church in Connecticut where there was a conference Monday and Tuesday. Great, great conference, by the way. Um... So a lot of this stuff is kind of fresh on the tip of my tongue, having just taught the whole thing. But I kind of went fast with them. You guys get the slow boat uh, version. So the first false doctrine that we talked about last time is the church stops seeing itself as a pilgrim. There is a book out there called The Pilgrim Church. You ever heard of that book? Uh, it's, and that's a wonderful title of the church because that's what the church is. And I gave you the verses last time, Hebrews eleven thirteen, First 1 Peter 1, 1, 1 Peter 2, 11, James 1, 1. Our home is never in this world. That's not our identity as a church. We're merely passing through this world. And that's what a pilgrim is. Uh, a pilgrim is someone passing through a terrain temporarily in route to their ultimate destination, which for us is the Father's house and then ultimately the kingdom and ultimately the eternal state. And that's, that's who we are, that's our identity. God never intended the church to sink its roots down deep into this earth. 
And that's why Philippians 3 verse 20 says our citizenship is where? In the United States. Well, we are citizens of the United States, but we're dual citizens. Citizen of a home country temporarily, but ultimately our citizenship is in heaven. Now do you see how that whole concept gets blurred once you see yourself as the establisher of God's kingdom? So that's the first problem is the church loses her identity. The second problem, and we got into this a little bit last time, is the church starts to move into what is called the social gospel. Has anybody heard of the social gospel? The social gospel basically in the 1920s took over what we call the seven sisters or the mainline denominations. And there was a split in those denominations between the liberals and the fundamentalists. And it was around that time period that Harry Emerson Fosdick preached a famous sermon entitled Against the Fundamentalists, Shall the Fundamentalists Win? And there was a war that took place for the heart and soul of those seven sisters or mainline denominations. And guess what, folks? We lost. That's why we're meeting here at Sugarland Bible Church in an independent church because we lost control of the mainline denominations. And when you lose control of the mainline denominations, you lose the property, you lose the libraries, you lose the endowments. And that's why you can drive around Houston and see these beautiful churches, stained glass windows and... Uh, you know, beautiful buildings, and yet what do they teach there? They teach oftentimes very liberal thinking. And to get conservative teaching, you have to go to these kind of storefront type churches. And people kind of make fun of us, and they say, well, why are you guys meeting in these storefront type churches? Well, there's a history there. It's called the modernist fundamentalist controversy. And we have a very nice, I think, very nice facility here. But most conservative churches don't have anything quite like this. You know, they're renting or they're meeting in a gym or, you know, a shopping mall or whatever. And the, 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 the reality as to why that's true has to do with the 1920s. And so what the modernists or the liberals began to teach in the mainline denominations in the 1920s was something called social gospel. Social gospel is the idea that the focus of the church is bringing in kingdom realities, which only Jesus Christ's kingdom can accomplish. And a lot of it relates to confusion because they think they're the kingdom. So if you think you're the kingdom, you're busy bringing in kingdom realities. So you get all this talk about, you know, the environment, the ecosystem, uh, being a good steward of the earth, um, social justice. You get a lot of talk about rectifying what they call structural racism or structural biases, universal health care and all of these kinds of subjects, and that kind of takes center stage. The goal of the church is to bring these things into existence. A lot of humanitarian work. You know, Jimmy Carter with his Habitat for Humanity, all of that kind of stuff. And that becomes sort of the focus of the church rather than the proclamation of the gospel. And that's what I mean by social gospel. Um, a friend of mine offered up this definition of social gospel that I thought was pretty good. It's giving water bottles out to people, like this one, as people are on their way to hell. Now I have a water bottle and I'm not on my way to hell. But that's kind of the mindset, is you go over to someone's house and you mow their lawn and you do all this stuff for them, but you never really give them the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's basically what is meant by social gospel. And when that happens, and the church can easily drift into this mindset as the 1920s, the fundamentalist, modernist controversy demonstrates, the great commission, the, the job that 
Jesus actually gave to the church becomes the great omission. Now, I want to be clear about one thing. I'm not against humanitarian work coming from the church. But you should always, we should always use that as a platform to preach the gospel. Because at the end of the day, what good does it do somebody to uh, have their stomach filled with food for 24 hours if they never hear the gospel and their soul goes into an eternal hell? So I'm, I'm not one of these that says don't do any humanitarian work, but the, the idea is you've got to keep it in balance or you'll move very fast into social gospel. And so the goal of social gospel is to change the structures of society. And that's where everybody is today. That's what they're writing books about within evangelicalism. It's about structural change, either from the right or from the left. And another name for this is holistic gospel. Holistic gospel is where you're more concerned about the collective salvation of nations than you are about individual souls. So collective salvation, holistic gospel, social gospel, I mean, these are all interchangeable terms. And take a look at Matthew 4, verse 19, just for a second, if you could. Let's see, that was, I was in Mark. I was going to wonder how I was going to tie that in. That had nothing to do with the topic, but it's a wonderful verse. Okay, Matthew 4, verse 19. He said to them, that's his disciples, Jesus speaking to his disciples, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So holistic gospel basically says... Now you're responsible not just to to be fishing for men, you're responsible for the fishbowl that they're in. And that's that's the change in emphasis, that's the change in focus. And it makes sense if we're the kingdom, right? We should be bringing these conditions to the earth. So Robert Schuller, you have this quote here, was talking about this back in the 1980s. And here he's condemning negative thinking theologians. I guess that would be people like ourselves. Negative thinking theologians look at the doctrine of sin and salvation and repentance through distorted glasses tinted with a mortification mentality. These guys, they really know how to call call you names, I tell you. Too many prayers of confession of sin and repentance have been destructive to the emotional health of Christians. I am not fully forgiven until I allow God to write his new dream for my life on the blackboard of my mind and I dare to believe I am, therefore I can. I am a child of God. This is basically the self-esteem gospel. Joel Osteen, just 20 minutes from here, is basically a younger version of Robert Schuller. I, I grew up 15 to 20 minutes from Garden Grove, countless times in, on the freeway I looked and saw that big cathedral of glass that Robert Schuller built, and I remember listening to many, many of his sermons. And when I listen to Joel Osteen today, it's exactly the same kind of stuff that Schuller teaches, or used to teach. Um, and of course, uh, Schuller got his ideas from a man named, uh, am I being, in, am I in trouble already? The hate speech folks are out to get us. Um, he got his ideas from a man named Norman Vincent Peale. You might recognize that name. Walter Martin one time was asked, what did he think about the theology of Norman Vincent Peale? And Martin, Walter Martin, a conservative, said, Paul is appealing that Peel's theology is appalling. And that's sort of stuck with me. So the, the chain goes from Norman Vincent Peel to Robert Schuller. Robert Schuller had a huge influence on Rick Warren. 
And Rick Warren, I think, has had a very big effect on Joel Osteen. So that's sort of the chain as we move into this sort of holistic redemption, self-esteem gospel. And Schuler has an interesting line in this. He says, God has a great plan to redeem society. See that? So we're all supposed to buy into this self-esteem gospel and society is going to be redeemed. The emerging church reformed according to the needs of self-esteemed, starved souls under the lordship of Jesus Christ will help us affirm the concept that while God's ideas may seem humanly impossible, he will give us these ideas which will lead to a glorious self-esteem generating success. So to be frank with you, I don't really know if the biggest problem with people is a lack of self-esteem. Do you, do you know they've done studies and do you know where they have the greatest percentage population wise of people with the highest self-esteem? In prison. <laughs> prison inmates have the highest self-esteem according to some statistics. And if you're struggling with self-image, there's a, there's a way to remedy that. It's to understand who you are in Christ and also to understand that you bear God's image. There's a biblical answer to it. It's not to put myself on the throne. But this, what he says here is social gospel. When he throws in this line, God has a plan to redeem um, society. Craig Blazing, one of the progenitors of progressive dispensationalism at Dallas Seminary, who teaches the already not yet form of the kingdom, writes this. Unfortunately, present day dispensationalists that would be us, have written very little in proposing a theology of social ministry. If we are a community of Christ worked on, if we as a community of Christ worked on creating our community as a model of social justice and peace, then we would really have some suggestions to make for social reform in our cities and nations. So you notice what he's done there is he's flipped the purpose of the church. The purpose is to bring peace and social justice into the church, whatever that means. That's kind of a nebulous concept, isn't it? But it's popular because people fill that nebulous concept with their own ideas. If they're coming from the left, they fill their ideas into that phrase. If they're coming from the right, they fill their ideas into that phrase. So Blazing says, who believes that Jesus is now reigning on David's throne, that we've got to bring social justice and peace to our church so we can go out and make changes in society that people will believe in. So once they see social justice in the church, society will then be attracted to our message and then you'll have social justice in the community. So all of these guys, whether it's Tim Keller, Al Mohler, Craig Blazing, Daryl Bach, they're all now moving in this direction of what I would call um, social gospel. Brian McLaren, a leader of the emerging church, says, and this is a stunning quote, the church has been preoccupied with the question, what happens to your soul after you die? As if the reason for Jesus coming can be summed up, Jesus is trying to get more souls into heaven as opposed to hell after they die. Now, I thought that was the goal. I mean, I thought that was the whole burden to share the gospel with the lost. So he says, I just think a fair reading of the gospels blows that out of the water. So in his understanding of the gospels, he sees Jesus going around doing all these miracles and feeding people and helping the poor. And he believes that Jesus didn't just preach uh, repentance and salvation and faith alone to escape hell. What Jesus did is he brought in this holistic societal change type of gospel. And if we don't do that, then we're missing out on what Jesus wants us to do. We're missing out on his um, example. There's a book out there by a man named Stearns. And he wrote a book called Hole in the Gospel. 
And I was talking to some people here in the local community and some of the big churches in our area and all their small groups. Oh, about a year or two, they were all reading this book by Stearns, Hole in the Gospel. Hole, H-O-L-E. He basically calls it the donut gospel. And basically what he's saying is we're caught up in a gospel that's empty because we're just preaching the Bible and preaching salvation, but we're not bringing all of these structural changes to society. And almost everybody who believes this and wants to do this believes we're currently in the kingdom. Kingdom now theology logically leads in that direction. Now, I could show you examples in the Bible where Jesus performed miracles to help people in terms of humanitarian need. And I could show you other examples in the Bible where Jesus stopped meeting people's humanitarian needs. Because he was more concerned about the soul, which is eternal, than uh, a meal for the day. Let me just show you a couple of examples. If you go over to John 6... Verse 15, and these are verses that will never be brought up by social, social gospel advocates. John 6 and verse 15, it says, So Jesus, perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force to make him the king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. So now he's got a crowd of people that, that are coming at him and they're, they're saying, you're gonna be the king whether you want to or not. We're gonna force you to be the king. Everybody wants Jesus to be the king at this point. Why is that? Because of the miracle that he just performed about the masses that were fed with a few fish and a few loaves earlier in the chapter. And then when you drop down to verse 26, Jesus answered and said, Truly I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Now I feel a little bit guilty reading that because I just had two hamburgers there in the kitchen. So he's got all these people that are following him, not because they care anything about eternity. They, they like the humanitarian side of what he's doing. And gosh, if this guy can feed the masses with a few loaves and a few fish, he could overthrow Rome. So it's all external stuff, politics. And they're not understanding why Christ came into the world. Christ came into the world to deal with the real need that we have, our separation from God because of sin. And so when you drop down to verses 28 and 29, it says, Therefore they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered, verse 29, and said to them, This is the work of God that you what? Believe in the one he has sent. So what you all need to do instead of looking for your next meal for me is you need to believe the one condition of justification in the one he has sent me and be saved so Jesus switches the conversation away from social gospel to the real gospel and so everybody stood up and applauded right no they weren't interested anymore in what he was saying if you drop down to verse 60 this is all taking place at a place called Capernaum, uh, near the Sea of Galilee. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, this is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, con conscious that his disciples grumbled at this, said to them, does this cause you to stumble? And then if you drop down to verse uh, 66, as a result, as a result of what? Changing the conversation away from humanitarian social gospel to the real gospel. As a result, verse 66, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. And I like what Jesus says here to the 12. I mean, you want to talk about church growth being destroyed? He just went from a massive crowd to 12. Would you hire a pastor like that? 
Yeah, I came in, I took over a church of a couple thousand people, and now there's 12 people left. (laughs) I mean, that's what Christ did here by focusing on the real gospel. And then um, verse, oh, I don't know, 67, Jesus said to to the 12, you don't want to leave too, do you? And Peter has, of course, the classic answer. I mean, Peter says, Lord, to whom else should we go? I mean, who else has the words of eternal life. So that's an example where Brian McLaren's analysis of Jesus is highly selective. I can show you another example where Jesus rejected social gospel. Uh, If you go over to, I believe it's in John 12. And let's see, some of you might have to help me with this. It's the story of Mary pouring expensive ointment on Christ. There it is in verses 1 through 8, right? Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they made him a supper, and Martha was serving, but Lazarus was one of the ones uh, reclining at the table. Mary then took a pound of very costly perfume of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair and the house was filled with fragrance of perfume. But Judas Iscariot said, he sounds like a social gospel advocate here, who was intending to betray him, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Verse 6, now he said this not because he really cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and used to put his hand in the money box and he used to pilfer what was put into it. So he wanted the money sold and put in the money, the perfume sold and put in the money box so he could help him embezzle more funds, in other words. And Jesus And that he masquerades his motive as social gospel. We need to help the poor. And look at Christ's response here. It's it's so interesting. Verse 7. Therefore Jesus said concerning Mary, let her alone. So that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For you will always have the poor with you. But you don't always have me. In other words, I'm here for an instant. So it would be completely appropriate for her to worship him in extravagance. The poor, you're you're always going to be able to help the poor. Don't worry about the poor right now. Worry about the moment that you're in. See that? And so you'll notice that Jesus, again, directs people away from helping the poor to individual worship. Now, Brian McLaren in his selective use of the Bible, isn't, isn't quoting these passages at all. And this is the weakness with social, social justice or social gospel. See, everybody is hijacking Jesus to make Jesus according to whatever their worldview is. So if you're a Marxist, you make Jesus into a Marxist revolutionary. If you're a socialist, you make Jesus into a socialist. If you're a humanitarian, you make Jesus into a humanitarian. And the reality of the situation is, I don't think Jesus is unconcerned about these issues, but that's not his primary issue from which he came into the world. He came into the world to rectify the alienation that exists before us and God through his death, burial, resurrection and ascension and so that's where we need to keep the focus as the church right Charles Ryrie says concerning holistic uh, gospel or holistic redemption Charles Ryrie correctly says holistic redemption can easily and you you might want to underline that word easily can easily lead to placing unbalanced, if not wrong priorities on political action, social agendas, and improving the structures of society. Now, 
am I against people um, being involved in humanitarian work? Am I against people being involved in politics? I'm not against that at all. But that is a matter of individual conscience. See that? Uh, William Wilberforce used his position in Parliament as an evangelical Christian to speak over and over again against the slave trade. And he eventually got the slave trade uh, abolished where he was. So God can use people in political things. I mean, I'm kind of the product of a political family. You know, my father was a judge. He was a superior court judge appointed by George Duke Majin, the governor in California. He was elevated to the appellate court. Um, and so my whole life, you know, and I was a political science major in college. I have a law degree. You know, my whole life has been politics, 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 politics. It clearly has a place. If people, as a matter of conscience, want to get involved in those things, praise the Lord. You have the freedom in Christ to do that. What I'm saying is that's not the priority of the church. That's what I'm saying. And that's the danger when all of these social causes eclipse what God wants the church to do. Uh, you go into the epistles and you don't find any instructions anywhere about how to take over Rome and all of these kinds of things. In fact, I think the whole book of Philemon, have you read Philemon? It's a long book, it's one chapter. Uh, you'll, you go home and read that, you'll enjoy it. That's some good reading there. Remember the slave Onesimus who had escaped and fled to where Paul was in Rome? And you remember what Paul told Onesimus at the end of that letter? He said, you need to go back to your owner Philemon as a slave. And you need to live out your Christian convictions in that structure. He never says overthrow the structure. He never says regime change or anything like this. And so my point is the church, when it gets, when, when it makes that its priority, it shifts onto its shoulders a task that God never gave to the church. So is that happening today? Well, Rick Warren talks about his peace plan, right? P-E-A-C-E. -E. Peace is an acronym for P, promote reconciliation. E, equip servant leaders. A, assist the poor. C, care for the sick. And E, educate the next generation. Coalition members see these actions as Jesus' antidote to slaying the five global giants. Now, why are there only five global giants? Probably because he's trying to make that fit with David going to you know, slay Goliath with five stones in his bag. I think that's what he's focused on, these five global giants. Problems, well, so what are the five global giants? Problems that affect billions of people worldwide. Spiritual emptiness, self-centered leadership, poverty, pandemic disease, and illiteracy. So Rick Warren and 1,700 leaders launched the Peace Coalition at the Purpose Driven Summit. Coalition members see these actions as Jesus' antidote to slaying the five global giants. Problems that affect billions of people worldwide. And then there's the five which we've already <clears throat> articulated. So what is this here? What do you call this? You call it social gospel. I mean, this, this is the very thing that consumed the mon mainline denominations in the 1920s. So it's a recycling of kingdom now theology. I think I gave you the quote last week about how, and you may have it there in your notes, how Rick Warren believes it's his purpose, and he likes that word purpose, right? Purpose-driven church, purpose-driven life, the whole goal is to find your purpose. He believes his purpose is to get the church involved in this activity of slaying these five global giants. And what do you not see in the peace plan? Do you notice what's missing? Yeah, the gospel's missing. 
the Great Commission is missing. These verses here are missing. Let's, let's look at some of those verses, shall we? Matthew 28, verse 19. This is, this is the assignment Jesus actually gave to the church. You know these verses very well. This is, this is the real great commission. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's the real job that we have. Go over to Mark 16. I'm just trying to show you the Great Commission passages as presented in the four Gospels and the book of Acts. Mark 16, verse 15. Mark chapter 16 and verse 15. And he said to them, to the, Jesus, to the disciples, go into all the world and slay the five global giants. No, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creation. Take a look at Luke, just to the right. Luke 24, verses 46 through 49. He, see, every gospel writer has a rendition of the Great Commission. He said to them, Thus it is written that Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning with Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And then if you look at verse 49, he says, Behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in Jerusalem, stay in the city, in other words, until you are clothed with power from on high. Now, aren't you glad they, they, they listened to the Lord and waited and didn't just go out there and try to do it through human power? Christianity would have fizzled a long time ago. And yet here we are 2,000 years later, recipients of the gospel on a totally different continent that's the power that's what the power of the holy spirit will do the holy spirit will empower the church when the church is what the church is supposed to be so that the game of satan is to try to change the church into something that it's not because once the church becomes something that it's not god is not authorized to pay the bill see that God will pay the bill for things that he orders on the menu. But on the other hand, if we go off and do our own thing, God has no authorization at all or interest in energizing us to being what we're supposed to be. Take a look at John 20, verse 21. John chapter 20 and verse 21. So you read these verses and you compare them to Rick Warren's peace plan and you, you, you can see the difference, right? John 20, 21, so Jesus said to them, peace be with you as the Father has sent me, I also am sending you. One more, two more actually, just for good measure. Look at Acts 1, verses 4 through 8. Remember there's a 40 day period in between Christ's resurrection and ascension when he's ministering to the disciples and if you look at Acts 1 verse 4 it says gathering them together he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem but to wait for what the father had promised which he said you heard from me for John baptized with water but you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit not many days from now. When was that prophecy fulfilled? Birthday of, Birthday of the church, day of Pentecost, next chapter. Now, watch this. This is very important, verse 6. So when they, that's the disciples, had come together, they were asking him, Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? Now, why would they ask that? Because they did not understand this long interim period of time that would come 
because national Israel in the first century rejected her king. And God would create the age of the church. We've been living in it for the last 2,000 years. They had no knowledge of the church age. All they knew was Israel, 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 Israel. Kingdom, 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 kingdom. But now something has happened where the nation has rejected her king. Now what's going to happen? Well, God's plan all along was to create the age of time that we are in called a mystery or an intercalation or an interruption in God's program and that program that we're in now is not Israel's program. It's the program of the church. It's hinted at many times in Christ's earthly ministry. Uh, don't worry, I'm going to come back to Acts 1 in just a minute. But over in Luke 19, verse 11, while they, now remember, Luke wrote a prequel and a sequel, right? The prequel is the Gospel of Luke, the sequel is the book of. Acts, two-part series. If you look at Luke 19, verse 11, it says, while they were listening to these things, Jesus went on to tell them a parable. This is the parable of the Minas. Why? Because he was near Jerusalem, and they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. Oh my goodness, the Lord is making his way to Jerusalem. He must be getting ready to set up the kingdom. And he's explaining to them that the kingdom is not going to be set up right now. You're in a period of what? Starts with a P. Postponement. So he reveals to them in the parable of the minas this long age where people are given minas, which is like a monetary sum or a denomination. And they're given different giftings or resources. And while the master is absent, see, when the kingdom comes, the master won't be absent. You see that? This is a new period of time where the, abs the master is absent. And we are to invest what God has given us during this interim time period. And the day will come when the kingdom comes where he will hold us to an accounting of what we did with what he gave us. And you might be saying to yourself, well, God hasn't given me anything. Well, every person in this room and every person listening has three things. That God is going to ask them, what do they do with those three things? These all begin with the letter T. The first thing you have is time. The second thing you have is talent. There are things you can do that nobody else in this room can do. And the third thing is treasure. Every person has those to one degree or another. Some more than others, some less than others, but every person has all three. And the Lord expects us in this interim, while he's not here, to invest those things for his purposes. And he's going to come back at the end of this interim age, and he's going to say, oh, by the way, what did you do with those three T's I gave you? Time, talent, and treasure. So the apostles aren't really hearing all of this stuff when you go back to Acts 1, and they thought, gosh, he's going to set up the kingdom. So when they had come together, I'm back in Acts 1, verse 6. They were asking him, saying, Lord, is it this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? Now, you'll notice the response here. Jesus says, well, whoever gave you an idea that there's going to be a kingdom through Israel? What a dumb idea that is. He never rebukes them for that. The only thing he corrects them on is not the establishment of the kingdom. By the way, who's the kingdom going to be established through? Through Israel. It's very clear. He, he never rebukes them for having the idea of a future kingdom through Israel. What he corrects them on is the issue of timing. See that? That's what the parable of the minas was designed to teach them. The kingdom is going to come one day, but now it's in a state of postponement. And in the interim, while the kingdom is not here, you're not supposed to waste your time setting it up. God is going to set it up one day. You're to spend your time investing the three T's. You see that? So if you look at verse 7, you see his answer. It is not for you to know the what? times or epics see where they were confused they didn't understand the interim age 
They didn't understand the church age. It is not for you to know the times or the epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. In other words, the kingdom will come when God wants it to come. But in the interim, verse 8, you will receive what? What does verse 8 say? You will receive power when you take a church growth seminar. No. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses where? First in Jerusalem, then get outside of Jerusalem and go into Judea and Samaria, and then go to the remotest parts of the earth. He's obviously not talking about the kingdom there, because the kingdom is headquartered where? Jerusalem. He's saying, get out of Jerusalem. It's the, it's the worldwide mission of the church while the kingdom is not here. So, very clearly, that's another rendition of the Great Commission, which you don't find at all in Rick Warren's peace plan. Go over to Romans chapter 1, just to the right. Romans 1, verses 16 and 17. Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the what? Power of God for salvation to everyone who what? Believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written. But the righteous man or the just shall live by faith. So the word power there, as you probably know, is the Greek word dunamis, where we get the word what? Dynamite. And we also get the word dynamic. And that's the source of power that the church is supposed to be disseminating. And this message is so powerful that it can be read in a book and someone could get saved. This message is so powerful that Satan could preach it. And if he does it accurately, people could get saved. This message is so powerful that people could, could use it to build their own platforms through poor motives. Paul talks about that in Philippians 1, around verses 14 through 17, I think it is, where he talks about, you know, some preach Christ out of, you know, strife, and seeking to take advantage of me being in here in prison. And what does Paul do? He doesn't get all mad at these people with corrupt motives preaching the gospel. He just says, well, thank God the gospel's going out. At least it's going out. Because the gospel is objectively true, regardless of whose mouth it comes out of. You see that? That's the power of the gospel. And what is bothering me about this peace plan as I don't see any reference to the gospel, except in sort of veiled terms. Spiritual emptiness, maybe that's, maybe that's what the gospel is supposed to be. But it's all these social causes which won't come into existence until the kingdom comes. You see that? So what's happened with all of these things is the church is losing her identity through kingdom now theology. That's what's happening. So who's going to set up the kingdom then? What do you think? Jesus, because you look at our chart here, you've got the second advent. By the way, what chapter of the book of Revelation is that found in? Revelation 19. And then the kingdom comes in Revelation 20. Now, do you all agree with me on this? Chapter 19 comes before chapter 20. Any disagreement on that? I mean, this is cutting edge stuff right here. <laughs> I mean, the, the order of the book of Revelation should tell you who's going to set up the kingdom. I mean, the, for, the, for the church to get involved in kingdom programs, kingdom building, and all of these things is basically a waste of time. Hal Lindsey wrote a book. Most people know Hal Lindsey for the book, The Late Great Planet Earth. And it's sort of interesting to go around the country and see how many people have been led to Christ through that book, The Late Great Planet Earth. Anybody, anybody read that book? A few people? Anybody, anybody become a Christian as a result of that book? 
I got very interested in Bible prophecy by reading that book. God used that book in a tremendous way. But I don't even think that's Hal Lindsey's best book. That's a good book, but if you really want a good read, get his book, The Road to Holocaust. That'll put some hair on your chest, if you're a man. (laughs) Best-selling author Hal Lindsey warned what could happen to the church in the last days if she began to see herself as the establisher of God's kingdom. And here's his quote. The last days of the church on earth may be largely wasted. See that? Seeking to accomplish a task that only the Lord himself can and will do directly. I hope these verses we've looked at tonight demonstrate that kingdom realities cannot be ushered in by the church. They're going to be ushered in by the king when the king comes back. So, do you think the devil's a pretty sneaky guy? Do you think the devil would pull this one on us on the eve of the rapture? Do you think he would confuse us to such an extent that we would spend the waning moments on the earth doing something that God never called us to do? I think Satan has been trying to confuse the church on this subject uh, all along. So when the church begins to move into kingdom now theology, she begins to flirt with losing her pilgrim status and moving into social gospel. Let me just introduce this third one here. We won't get far on it. But the church starts getting involved in ecumenical and interfaith alliances. Have you heard the term ecumenism? Ecumenism is the urge to merge. That's ecumenism. It's the desire to merge with groups, other spiritual communities that don't hold to our same core convictions, biblically. And the reason this plays directly into Kingdom Now theology or emanates from Kingdom Now theology is because there's not enough Christians on planet earth numerically to cause Christianity to bring in the kingdom. There's just not enough of us numerically. So if your goal is to bring in the kingdom, then you've got to merge with this group down the street that doesn't think the way we do biblically, that might agree with us on some political issue, or this other group, or this other group. And so ecumenism, or the urge to merge, results in kingdom, uh, is a result of kingdom now theology. In other words, the idea is you merge with groups to be a, and here's the technical word, a co-belligerent. A co-belligerent against some cause. Uh, Communism, humanism, Uh, pornography, abortion, you know, you're upset about some cause and there's not enough Christians to get rid of that issue and so you've got to merge with some group politically that you agree with on that issue but you totally and completely disagree with theologically. That's what I mean by ecumenical and interfaith alliances. Clarence Larkin in 1920, and I love reading the old commentators, really do. You know, when I was taking my dissertation at Dallas Seminary, they basically told me that I couldn't quote anybody in my dissertation that's older than five to ten years. Because I had to be kind of in vogue with contemporary scholarship. And I thought that was tragic because if you bypass the older commentators, you miss a lot of wisdom. Clarence Larkin is basically known for his prophecy charts, but he wrote a commentary on Daniel, which is excellent, and Revelation, which is excellent. And in this book here, Rightly Dividing the Word, he predicts what happens to the church when she begins to see herself as the new Israel on earth. 
He says the great mistake that the church has made is appropriating to herself in this dispensation. What dispensation? The church age. The promises of earthly conquest and glory which belong exclusively to Israel in the millennial age. That's kingdom now theology, right? So you look over at Israel's promises and you say, well, those look pretty good. Let's just make them available to the church and you deliteralize them, right? You have to always deliteralize these promises to make them fit the current age of the church. It is very interesting to me that nobody ever appropriates Israel's curses. Have you noticed that? <laughs> For disobedience. Read Deuteronomy 28 sometime. Verses 15 through 68 are all curses for disobedience. We'll just leave those behind for the Jewish people. But we'll take all the goodies. The great mistake the church has made in appropriating herself in this dispensation, the promises of an earthly conquest and glory which belong exclusively to Israel in the millennial age. As soon as the church enters into alliances with the world and seeks the help of parliaments, Congresses, legislatures, federations, and reform societies made up largely of ungodly men and women. Now, why is he talking about this in 1919? What's happening in the Seven Sisters or the mainline denominations? The fundamentalist modernist controversy. So, how, how does that saying go? Those that don't learn from history are what? Condemned to repeat it. If you know a little bit about church history, you can see how the same lies keep recirculating. So what happens when the church gets involved in all of these tasks? She loses her spiritual power and becomes helpless as a redeeming force. Why is that? Because when the church moves outside of its design, God says, I'm not obligated anymore to write the checks. It's your task, you fund it. And the church is emptied of his power. See that? And so this is what he, uh, he predicted in 1919. So what do we have today? The urge to merge. We have evangelicals and Catholics together. Have you heard of this? This was a movement uh, largely started by the late Charles Coulson who did a lot of good things, wrote a lot of good books, started prison fellowship ministries. But around early 1990s, he started this movement called ECT, Evangelicals and Catholics Together. And the goal was to fight some ism out there. Humanism, communism, atheism, we all got to come together. So the idea is we've all got to hang together or we're going to hang separately. And you merge with some group that you don't agree with theologically for the purpose of fighting an evil. So forget about doctrine. Don't worry about that. What we got to do is we got to save America or save the planet or whatever it is you're trying to save. And once we get that task rectified, then we'll get back to theology. This is how the church gets pulled into these ecumenical causes. So in this Evangelicals and Catholics Together, it was a written agreement, and I can't tell you how many very notable evangelicals put their John Hancock on the document, where it was an agreement that we're not going to evangelize each other anymore. We're not going to share the gospel and try to evangelize one another's sheepfolds. Because after all, we're all big one happy family, right? Right? And we're all coming together for some great cause. And uh, this is how um, ecumenism and interfaith alliances start to develop. And just when you think the whole thing had died because Chuck Colson died, here he comes again. Rick Warren comes back and brings the whole thing to life. And this is an interview that he did on EWTN, which is a Roman Catholic network. And he is interviewed here by Raymond Arroyo. If you watch Fox News, you'll see Raymond Arroyo a lot 
on Laura Ingram's show, The Angle. And he's very Catholic, and he's interviewing uh, Rick Warren here. And it's a lengthy quote, and I won't give this to you because we're ready to stop. But the most important line is this. He says, but the important thing is if you love Jesus, we're on the same team. That's the ecumenical mindset. If you love Jesus, we're on the same team. We have a little problem. Because what Jesus are you talking about? Is there not a false Jesus in the world? Don't the Jehovah's Witnesses teach a Jesus and the Mormons teach a Jesus? How do I know it's the right one? So we will stop here and pick this up next time.